Hey everyone, this is Ben with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this anatomy lesson, I'm going to cover the vertebral column, also known as the spine, the spinal column, or the backbone. The vertebral column not only houses the spinal cord, which is located within that vertebral cavity, but it also distributes weight to the lower limbs, supports the head, allows for the attachment of various muscles and ligaments, and it facilitates movement and stability. The vertebral column is part of the axial skeleton, and it is made up of 33 individual bones during youth, which anatomists classify as irregular bones. Approximately nine of the bones at the terminal end of the spine later fuse in adulthood to form two larger bones, the sacrum and the coccyx, which I covered in detail in previous anatomy videos on this channel. After the bones of the sacrum and coccyx fuse, the typical vertebral column consists of 26 bones, which anatomists divide into five main regions. And yes, you're gonna to want to remember these five regions for your anatomy exams. The first region is the cervical region, which consists of seven cervical vertebrae, which make up the neck, and they are abbreviated as C1 through C7. Anatomists also call this region the cervical spine and seven and cervical both start with the same s sound, so that can help you remember that there are seven cervical vertebrae. Next, you have the thoracic region, which consists of 12 thoracic vertebrae, abbreviated as T1 through T12. And it is super easy to remember that there are 12 thoracic vertebrae because they articulate with the 12 pairs of ribs to form part of that thoracic cage. And so you have 12 ribs and you have 12 thoracic vertebrae. And 12 and thoracic both start with the letter T, so that can also help you remember. Next, you have the lumbar region, which consists of five lumbar vertebrae. And these are abbreviated as L1 through L5. And these vertebrae are larger and denser than the preceding vertebrae, allowing them to support the weight of the upper body. And when you add five lumbar vertebrae to the seven cervical vertebrae, you get 12, which is kind of interesting because that's how many thoracic vertebrae you had in between them. Also, people who work nine to five jobs often complain of having lower back pain when they clock out at five. So that's how I remember there are five lumbar vertebrae. Just below the lumbar vertebrae, you have the one sacrum bone, which consists of five fused sacral vertebrae, which anatomists label S1 through S5. This triangular bone articulates with the hip bones laterally and with the coccyx bone inferiorly to form the bony pelvis. And then finally, you have that one coccyx bone, which consists of three to five fused coccygeal vertebrae, which anatomists abbreviate as CO1 through CO4 or five or three, depending on how many you have. And this bone is also called the tailbone, and it represents the terminal end of the vertebral column. Now between these vertebrae, you have 23 intervertebral discs, which separate, anchor, and cushion each vertebra. However, it is important to note that there is no intervertebral disc between C1, which is also called atlas, and C2, which is called axis, or between the sacrum and coccyx bones. As you move down the spine, these shock absorbing pads of fibrocartilage progressively thicken in size, and they consist of two main parts, the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus. The nucleus pulposus is a gel-like center of the intervertebral disc, and it is comprised of a mixture of water, collagen, and proteoglycans. Let the name help you out here. Nucleus means the central part of something, and pulposus is just a fancy word that means pulp. So this is the pulpy center of the intervertebral disc. The annulus fibrosus surrounds the nucleus pulposus in a series of ringed fibrocartilage layers, which is what the word annulus means. It means ring. And the fibrosus just refers to the fibrous nature of the rings, which consists of type one and type two collagen. Now the interesting thing about this annulus fibrosus is that each ring layer is gonna have fibers arranged at an oblique angle, which alternates with each ring. So it creates kind of like an X-like crisscross pattern. And these intervertebral discs are capped at the top and bottom with a thin cartilaginous end plate. 
Now let's take a look at the curves of the vertebral column. And as you look at it from the side, you'll notice right away that it's in a sort of S curved shaped pattern. And it has four curvatures. Two of them are called primary curvatures and the other two are called secondary curvatures. The primary curvatures, which are also called kyphotic curves, are curves that were present during fetal development. These curves are convex, curving outwardly toward the back side of the body, and they include the thoracic curvature, again T1 through T12, and the sacrococcygeal curvature, which includes the sacrum and coccyx bone. The secondary curvatures are also called lordotic curves, and these are curves that slowly begin to form in the spine postpartum after the baby's been born. And these curves are concave, curving inwardly toward the front of the body. And they are going to include the cervical curvature, which is C1 through C7, as well as the lumbar curvature of L1 through L5. And I'll talk a little bit more about some ligaments in the spine in a future video when I talk about the anatomy of a typical and then of course some of those specific regional vertebrae. Okay, that wraps up this video over the anatomy of the vertebral column. Now we have a free quiz that you can take on our website by clicking the link in the description or comment section below. That will help test you over this content and retain as much information as possible. In addition, we have an entire playlist of anatomy videos. So if you're studying this right now, you might want to check that out. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe.